Welcome everybody for our monthly episode of uh, the University of Miami Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Symposium every third Thursday of the month. This is session 38, if you believe it. It's unbelievable. It's been going on now almost two years. It's September 16, 2021. We have another fantastic uh, group of four panelists who I'll, I will introduce at the end of this uh, presentation. To remind you, we are about here in, on September 16. You can see the speakers that are coming up uh, through the end of this calendar year before we put together the program for 2022, since unfortunately, it sounds like these Zoom symposia are here to stay, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, uh, so uh, David Altschuler, my current cerebrovascular and skull base fellow, will also join us and will uh, present one case to our panelists after they finish their talks. I'm Jacques Morcos, the professor and co-chair here in the uh, Department of Neurosurgery, and I direct cerebrovascular and skull base surgery. Uh, always a pleasure to be with my uh, co-directors and partners, Carolina Benjamin, who directs our Keynes uh, Dissection Lab, and Carolina specializes in brain tumor and skull base surgery. Mike Ivan, Associate Professor, Director of Research at the UM Brain Tumor Initiative. And Mike, uh, of course, specializes in brain tumor, skull base, and epilepsy surgery. And Bobby Stark, uh, who is co-director of endovascular uh, of, uh, in the uh, University of Miami. I'd like to put in a plug for two other groups of symposia that, are, that go on as well from our department and uh, from the, our pediatric neurosurgical colleagues on Mondays uh, and their next uh, for example, next uh, session in a, is on hydrocephalus research, advanced and future clinical directions. The, now the date is not uh, set yet, but uh, please be on the lookout for the exact day for uh, uh, this uh, in October. Uh, you can see the two speakers there. Uh, and of course, Mike Ivan directs the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposia, and he does it uh, on every first Wednesday of the month, October 6, will be pleasure to have Jeff Bruce from Colombia talk about management of pineal region tumors. So be sure to join us if you're interested in the topic. This symposium that's going on right now for next month, those of you interested in cerebrovascular, we have a fantastic panel uh, of great debates in cerebrovascular. Ilad Levy is going to tell us the provocative title, The Progressive Extinction of Craniotomy for Aneurysms. Pablo is going to, Rubino from Argentina is going to try to debate him and say the essential need of microsurgery in the treatment of aneurysms. We'll have Felipe Albaquerque from the BNI talking about cracking the safe in endovascular approaches to the cavernous sinus. And last but not least, Greg Zipfel is going to talk to us uh, from OSU, optimizing outcome during aneurysm surgery, the importance of intra-op intra -op vascular assessment. So you can see it's a really exciting panel as today's panel is. So that's October 21. Many thanks to the team that makes these symposia happen, particularly Ignacio Escalona, who is uh, running it today. These are some links, those of you who want to access all the previous recordings the last couple of years, you can see them and view them on, on the link I sh I'm showing you at the top and feel free to email me and, uh, or to connect to our departmental or my personal Twitter account and uh, any questions you may have. We have four fantastic speakers. I've asked every one of them to speak for about 20 minutes and questions that you will undoubtedly have, write them down in the Q&A box at the bottom on your right, uh, and we will address them at the end of the session. Uh, uh, my pleasure now to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Uh, Maria Peris Selda, a spectacular neurosurgeon. We've, I've seen her uh, grow from a student to a resident to a fellow to one of the just incredible neuroanatomist and surgeon. She's joined back the Mayo Clinic in Rochester with Mike Link after having done 
residency at Albany, and and she is one of the Michael Angelos uh, uh, of that uh, Al Roten used to talk about as you will see undoubtedly in our present presentation, one of the true neurosurgical neuroanatomists. So it's a pleasure to hear her talk about beyond the cella, the unseen anatomy in pituitary surgery. Uh, then will be Albert Kim. Albert was with me. I can't believe it's been that long. He was my fellow about 11, I think about 11 years ago. He's at Wash U, director of the powerhouse of a program of benign and malignant brain tumors. Albert, uh, it was a joy to have him as my fellow. Again, it's been a pleasure to see him blossom into his own for many years now. And he's going to talk about management of aggressive adenomas. Uh, third in line is Jim Evans, who of course is a past president of the North American Skull Base Society uh, at Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jim and I are friends for many years. He always looks the same, doesn't age a single day. He is, uh, 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 um, he is, uh, he has that celebrity face look to him. I'm blanking on a second which actor I was going to say you look like. It'll come back to me by the end of the talk, but uh, we'll pass. But uh, uh, but uh, Jim uh, uh, will, is going to talk to us again. He could have handled any topic in skull base, but. Uh, we, we chose to give him endonasal endoscopic repair techniques, which is really where the rubber meets the road with endonasal endoscopy. And last but not least, and really for the, I think the first time, no, no, we've done it before with some of our UM faculty. Uh, we have a non-neurosurgeon, but a phenomenal uh, rhinologist, Lee Zimmer, who is also an officer at the NASBS, who I've known for several years through NASBS, from Mercy Health in Cincinnati and Lee will talk to us about very important topic that most neurosurgeons don't know very much about and need to hear, which is short-term sinonasal quality of life changes following endoscopic pituitary surgery. So I'm going to stop talking now and invite Maria to share her screen, unmute her microphone and dazzle us with your art, Maria. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure, of course, to be here and a privilege for me. And I just want to make sure you see and uh, hear me okay and you see my screen. Both are perfect. Perfect. So uh, I'm going to talk about today uh, about the what we see and what we don't see in pituitary surgery. And this is about the cellar and paracellar regions and also the supracellar regions. And as we know, the, the sphenoid sinus is in the center of the skull base. We have you know, different types of pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus that's gonna guide our uh, surgeries, especially in the cellar and supracellar space. And we have, this is um, you know, the usual configuration of the cellar type of sinus. Sometimes we have a bracellar type of sinus in which the pituitary gland is basically at the level of pneumatization of the sphenoid. And sometimes we have the conchal sinus in which we don't have any of the recesses of the sphenoid sinus. And that's make this makes the surgery a little bit more difficult. But this is the most useful configuration. And this is the sphenoid sinus and more, um, in about 33% of the cases or so, we have an onodic cell that is the most posterior ethmoid cell that pneumatizes on top of the sphenoid sinus, but that's the ethmoid. And it, uh, it is pneumatized around the optic nerve and the carotid artery. And when that happens, we need to know it because if not, uh, if we think that we can um, open superiorly here because we are still in the ethmoid, that can be very dangerous. And we need to know that and, and look at it in the preoperative scans. So that's an anatomical variation that we um, really look for. So if we are uh, looking at the cellar and paracellar region, uh, so this is the pituitary fossa right here where the pituitary gland uh, sits. And then from anterior to posterior, we have the cribriform plate, so that's the cristagalli, that's the planum of the sphenoid, and then we have the limbs of the sphenoid, 
the tuberculum posteriorly, just superior to the cella, the pituitary um, fossa, and this is the dorsum and the posterior climax. And then we see that in between uh, both, these are the optic nerves, between both optic nerves, we have between the limbus of the sphenoid and the tuberculum, this is an area that we call the prechasmatic sulcus or chasmatic sulcus, which is extremely important uh, in endoscopic endonasal surgery because it's a very good key landmark for us. So if we have to build the skull base, we have the sphenoid bone where the pituitary gland is going to sit. And then posteriorly, we have um, the vitreous part of the temporal bone and the occipital bone. If we look from posterior to anterior in the anterior cranial fossa, we have the frontal bone articulating with the ethmoid and then articulating with the sphenoid bone. If we look at the sphenoid bone uh, from the front, this is an anterior view, this is the sphenoid sinus, and then we see the lesser wings of the sphenoid in both sides, the greater wings of the sphenoid, the pterygoid plates, plates, and this is the body of the sphenoid. If we look superiorly, then we can also um, look at exactly what I was talking about before. This area that is flat is called the plenum of the sphenoid. Then in between both optic canals, we have the prechasmatic sulcus between the limbus of the sphenoid and the tuberculum. This is the pituitary fossa. And then if we look carefully at the clinoid processes, we have an anterior clinoid process that is just lateral uh, to the carotid and superior, uh, the cavernous carotid. We have a middle clinoid process that is in constant and is more than two millimeters in, in about 30% uh, of the cases, like in this side. And these are the posterior clinoids. If we put the carotid here in the cavernous sinus, uh, this is the clinoidal segment of the carotid right here. And then we see the cavernous segment with the posterior band and an anterior band, which is uh, the cellar. Um, when we see the cellar prominence of the, cell, uh, of the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, this is what it is. This is the anterior band of the carotid. So again, looking anteriorly, at, uh, at an image, an anatomical image of a sphenoid bone. Then if we put together the optic nerve and the carotid artery, this is again anteriorly, we see in between the carotid artery and the optic nerve in the optic canal, we see here uh, what we call the optic strut that divides uh, or separates both structures here and forms part also of the optic canal. So the optic canal has a medial part that is facing the sphenoid sinus, uh, a superior part that is uh, part of the lesser wing of the sphenoid and then continuates with the anterior clinoid process. And the lateral part and inferior part is formed by, by the optic strut. So again, looking at the optic canal from now from a posterior point of view, then we see the superior aspect. This is uh, part of the lesser wing of the sphenoid. Then continuation, uh, in continuation, we see the anterior clinoid process. Again, the optic strut. And then medially, this is all that we can accomplish endonasally when we decompress the optic canal. So now looking at the middle clinoid processes that are also very important in endoscopic surgery, this is a small cli middle clinoid process. These are called the kissing clinoids in which they almost touch each other, the anterior clinoid and the middle clinoid. And this is a carotical clinoid ring. So it's extremely important to know where we're gonna find the middle clinoid if we have a middle clinoid process, especially when we have to go lateral to purely the pituitary gland. So if we build the skull base again, this is the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid in the back. And going step by step through a transcellar approach, this is the left uh, nasal cavity with the septum, the inferior, and the middle turbinate. And then we progress, this is the superior turbinate, push it to the side. In this case, we have a supreme turbinate. This is the coena, 
And then when we, when we perform an opening to access the sphenoid sinus for a transcellular approach, um, transtubercular or transplanum, then we can see this is the ostium of the sphenoid, and this is uh, a posterior ethmoidectomy. That is very important. In this side, we have not performed a posterior ethmoidectomy, and this really gives us much better access to the sphenoid. So it's very important to complete uh, in most cases, the posterior ethmoidectomy. And sometimes when we only do the ethmoidectomy and we don't perform a sphenoidotomy, we can even see that anatomical variation that I pointed out before, that is the anodic cell. So this is a very nice example of an anodic cell. That's the sphenoid sinus here, not opened. And this is opening the posterior ethmoid. We actually see the optic canals. So this is something that we have to be very careful about. So this is exactly another nodi cell. So when looking forward inside the sphenoid sinus, once we have performed a posterior ethmoidectomy and the sphenoidotomy, then we can really have very good access to the optic canals and the carotid arteries. And this is the sphenoid septations that are actually uh, going actually go to the carotid in more than 70 to 80% of the cases. So they are, we cannot trust them in midline. The only structure that we can trust that is midline is the rostrum of the sphenoid, but not the sphenoid patients. So once we drill carefully the sphenoid septation that we have access to the cella, and this is a very pneumatized um, sphenoid sinus in which we see several recesses and uh, prominences that are very important. There are three recesses and three prominences in the cella. This is the cellar prominence. These are the uh, optic nerve prominences. And on the side, um, both sides of the cella, we have the carotid prominences. Then we have the tuberculum recess, just superior to the cella. Optical carotid recesses on the sides and the clival recess. And then if we put together uh, one and the other, then we have the optic nerve prominences would be on the other side medially. And in between them, we're gonna have, this is the precasmatic sulcus that we will see what corresponds it to uh, endonasally. But we saw in the lab that the tuberculum really is where the diaphragm of the cell attaches to. And that's a very good landmark. And then in between the anterior and uh, the tuberculum and the limbus of the sphenoid, this area here that is the precasmatic sulcus, when we go uh, with the endoscopic and macroscopic microscopic view, we see that this area here, just superior to the optic prominence, is really the limbus of the sphenoid. The tuberculum recess, uh, some uh, people call these uh, medial optical carotid recess, just the side of the tuberculum recess, uh, is corresponds to the tuberculum and the attachment of the diaphragm of the cella. The brachiasmatic sulcus in between both optic nerve prominences corresponds to, uh, is right here in between both optic nerve prominences and exactly corresponds to this area. And if we are going to find a middle clinoid process in, in a patient, then we will find it right here around the superior middle aspect of the C shape of the carotid artery. Same thing if we uh, have a corticoclinoid ring. So this is a superior view of the cella, uh, cella area with the pituitary gland, uh, the tuberculum, and the attachment of the diaphragm of the cella. And this is the carotid and the ophthalmic artery, the optic nerve in the optic canal. So if we go through uh, a little bit more of anatomy here, we see this is the, when we drill the bone, uh, this is the um, periosteal layer of the dura that covers the pituitary gland and also covers the cavernous sinus. The pituitary gland is covered by two layers of dura. And here, if we look at uh, what we have laterally, the unseen anatomy that we, we don't see, but we need to know when we operate in the cellar and supracellar area, is just in the brachiasmatic sulcus, we are going to have posteriorly the optic chiasm. It's not exactly under the dura, 
is usually posteriorly unless it has been pushed forward by the tumor or the lesion that we are treating. The ophthalmic artery really goes in this uh, part very medial and very anterior. So uh, when opening the dura to operate on supracellular lesion, you have to be very careful when you open this way because it's easy to injure the ophthalmic artery there. And then we have the cavernous sinus on the side and we need to know where um, the nerves are. This is the cis cranial nerve, this is V1, and this is uh, the third cranial nerve. Just looking at uh, when we resect the dura, this is where the middle pinot would be if we had one in this uh, specimen. And we can see very nicely here the ACAs, the basilar artery just taking away uh, all the bone and the dura. And this is how it looks like in real life. This is a, an example of a sphenoid sinus, tuberculum recess, the optic nerve prominences, the carotid prominences, the lateral optical carotid recess, and the cellar prominence. So uh, I'm gonna go through a few cases uh, to show some of the anatomy that we can see and some of the anatomy that we can't see and we see in other type of cases, not just pituitary surgery. This is a very large pituitary, resulted to be a pituitary adenoma in a patient who, young patient who presented with hydrocephalus. We put an EVD in and uh, brought him for surgery. So usually very expanded uh, cella. And here we really went above, uh, this is the precasmatic sulcus. So we know that the diaphragm of the cella is there. Um, and we drilled a little bit of the uh, uh, planum, so the tuberculum, the planum, uh, because we didn't know if we had to go uh, above or not, and if the, the tumor would fall down with a little bit of traction. But um, you know, it was this is working with angle scopes, and we can see here some of the arachnoid, and the tumor was quite firm. Uh, this is working with 45 degree endoscopes, trying to maximize our approach. Uh, and it really helped to have, um, this is looking up, it really helped to have a bigger opening. Uh, this is the arachnoid diaphragm coming down, an opening here, and this is what's uh, remaining of the pituitary gland. And this is our reconstruction with a dural graft and a free mucosal graft. And this is the post-op, the patient did very well, fortunately. Um, so really it's important to, even though we didn't cut the dural diaphragm of the cella, it was very important for us to be able to reach and move the dura forward so we could uh, reach the supracellar area. So this is again, uh, the, the cellar and paracellar areas, a straight view of the sinuses. And when we drill, uh, it's very important to know the dural layers. Uh, so this is the outside, the periosteal layer uh, of the dura. And this covers uh, the pituitary gland and the cavernous sinus. So when we open the outer layer, we are inside the cavernous sinus completely. If we open lateral to the pituitary gland, so this is after a removal of the outer layer of the pituitary gland. Uh, we see here, um, you know, the meningeal layer. This is the periosteal layer that gives you access uh, to the cavernous sinus. So this is the cavernous sinus, uh, the, the cavernous uh, carotid, and we can see the posterior bend and the anterior bend. This is a mid uh, sagittal section uh, and the cavernous sinus. So the pituitary tumors tend to go in these spaces um, between the anterior and the posterior bend and also behind uh, the vertical aspect of the posterior uh, cavernous carotid. And we can see here that the nerve in the roof will be the third cranial nerve. This is the fourth, this is sixth, and this is V1. So that explains why in pituitary apoplexy, uh, there uh, can be you know, ophthalmoplegia, uh, et cetera, exactly because it expands the cavernous sinus laterally. So we came up with um, uh, another, uh, another, a little bit alternative way to incise the dura when going to the cavernous sinus laterally. So we incise here in the intercavernous sinus and we get um, through both layers of the dura and with a, knife, a feather knife that just cuts 
uh, it's like a 90 degree dissector. It just progresses and we can actually get very safely into the cavernous sinus without, without having to incise just medial to the carotid artery. And we do, for instance, a biopsy of this lesion where we actually incised in midline rather than just close to the carotid. So then in the last few minutes, I'm gonna go through uh, a few uh, cases um, very quickly. So just to show how you know, some tumors and some consistency of tumors makes us see more or less anatomy. In this case, this is an acromegaly patient um, and quite you know, a firm tumor that seems to dissect pretty well from the, from the gland. Just trying to extract it in, in almost one piece. And just to see that uh, then it's, I think it's very important to uh, have a good uh, ENT partner, and of course, to do the, every surgery in endoscopic skull base and lateral skull base, of course. But you know, it's very important to look around because there are always, you know, the tumors hide in different places. So this is the pituitary gland that has been um, preserved here, and then we're gonna now chase the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. I'm not gonna. Um, continue the video, but this is the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. We have to put some surgery flow in there before we remove it, but uh, this is just looking up into the diaphragm. And then, for instance, in this uh, redo case of uh, Cushing's disease, a uh, very young patient previously operated on radiated, we can see tumor actually in both cavernous sinuses and the pituitary stalk was in midline. We don't see it very well here. But just to show, and I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna pass this a little bit quicker, but I just want to show that um, this is actually the diaphragm of the cella right here. And there's tumor on one cavernous sinus and on the other cavernous sinus. And here we're gonna have, this is the medial wall of the, uh, uh, of actually the, the cavernous sinus. So there's tumor on both sides and infiltrating, of course, the cavernous sinus. And so just taking the tumor out from, uh, from that space. And just to look at the different bands of the carotid artery. So this is uh, cleaning the tumor from the posterior band of the carotid. And then we're gonna see at the end, the anterior band of the carotid. So we can basically see um, this is stimulating for the third cranial nerve, just superior to the posterior band of the carotid. And then we ended up removing, of course, this, uh, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. I'm gonna pass this in the interest of time, but that's the post-op. He received gamma knife here because uh, it was for sure at least microscopic um, tumor. Uh, and then this is another way we see uh, these tumors where they invade the cavernous sinus. And um, this is just uh, to show very quickly uh, this uh, non-functioning macroadenoma with vision loss in a 50-year-old patient. And yes, we have to make sure that we look around, of course, and there are two types of diaphragm, actually. The diaphragm that we call uh, the diaphragm in, uh, in surgery is actually the arachnoid that comes down. It's not the dural diaphragm. So this is part of the diaphragm here. We see the pituitary here and the arachnoid diaphragm. And that's the post -op. So just uh, looking uh, at the uh, supracellular space, we just have to uh, be aware of the anterior cerebral arteries and the front orbital arteries and the frontopolar arteries here. And this is a supracellular view in which we opened in what I call the keyhole of endoscopic surgery, 
uh, that for me is the pre-chiasmatic sulcus. And here we see the optic chias, and this is what the pituitary tumors are going to push up. Uh, and this is the pituitary stock and all the uh, vessels. And these are the anterior cerebral, uh, cerebral arteries, the pituitary stock. And this is the arachnoid that actually enlarges and is pushed up uh, in uh, tumors, uh, in pituitary tumors. And this is laterally uh, in the supracellular space into the carotid cistern. And this is a, a tumor. This is a craniopharyngioma. I'm going to pass here. Um, and just, um, just to show in uh, one more minute, if time allows, this is a small meningioma that had been growing just to look at this anatomy. And this is just in the prechiasmatic uh, sulcus between both optic uh, canals that have been, uh, uh, been, have been exposed here and just above the, uh, the dural diaphragm of the cella. And the arachnoid really helps once the attachment of the uh, tumor has been removed, just pulling very gently. And taking out the tumor. And we're gonna have a very good look at the anatomy there of the supracellular space. And uh, cutting the arachnoids very carefully to make sure that there are no uh, the small hypophyseal uh, vessels are not attached there. And just taking the last bit of the tumor out in the optic canal. And that's the optic chias, the superior hypophyseal arteries right there. So that's uh, another example. And that's uh, basically, you know, all the lesions that we can find, many, many lesions in the cellular and supracellular space, uh, arachnoid cysts, raspberry, Rathkis cleft sixth, uh, et cetera. But this is a very important anatomy that we need to know from the intracranial and from the endonasal point of view. And that's all I, I wanted to show today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Maria, very much for this fantastic uh, exposition of both surgery and, and the anatomy under lying the need to know it uh, to do proper surgery thank you um, i'll invite albert to carry on now with i believe you're going to talk about aggressive pituitary adenomas that's right hi uh, everybody thanks for joining us and jacques thanks for inviting me to this uh, zoom posium uh, it's really a privilege to be among accomplished and talented colleagues even if it's in digital space and yeah, you, you know, it is amazing that it's it's already been 10, 11 years since uh, my fellowship with you. I, I still have to say every once in a while, uh, something in a French Lebanese accent escapes my mouth in the OR every once in a while. Okay, so uh, thanks again. I'm going to be talking about uh, essentially the management of aggressive adenomas. It's a really more conceptual. I'll use some case examples to highlight what I'm thinking about. And I'll tell you about some outcome studies as well. These are really not relevant. So Gertrude Stein said, you know, rose is a rose is a rose. People, most people understand this essentially to mean the law of identity. Some have issue with that, but essentially the law of identity. But uh, as we all know, roses can be very different. Uh, and the same can be said of adenomas. And so when I think about aggressive adenomas, I wonder if we're all really talking about the same thing. And so are uh, we talking about a large adenoma? And this actually is very similar to one that Dr. Paracelda showed. This is a six-year-old female with obesity and hypertension who's found to have uh, be somnolent after cholecystectomy, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, this is really a case for the time. She was found to have COVID-19, and then we had to wait a week while she, her respiratory status stabilized. Uh, she did have an EVD placed. And what that 
excuse me. And so this is what it looked like. Again, uh, uh, this tumor blowing out the cella, as well as the second compartment that was reaching into the third ventricle up to the level of the aqueduct and the foramen of Monroe. So we, this is a case I did yesterday with the very talented ENT surgeon, Dr. Christine Clark Cromwell. We did uh, also a transtubercular approach, you know, a little mini chef hat upside down, so to speak. And uh, after kind of cutting the superior intercavernous and diaphragm, uh, we opened it like a French door. And it was interesting that the bottom part shelled out pretty easily. It was a firm tumor, but the top part was actually a bowed out infundibulum. And uh, so we had to cut the infundibulum open. And it was actually a focus of hemorrhage. It looks like it was apoplexy within that infundibular region. So we saw the frame in Monroe post up here where you could see the foramina. She looks uh, very well. Or are we talking about large and invasive uh, tumors of the cavernous sinus? Again, uh, very much like some of the ones that Dr. Paracelda showed. This is a 25 year old guy with a history of Cushing's disease as, uh, who presented with um, pituitary tumor apoplexy and oculomotor paresis. Uh, We'll do, we did a surgery. I'll tell you. I'll tell you about that real briefly. But on pathology, he was ACTH positive, and he had a high KI67 index, like seven percent. So this is what it looked like pre-op. Uh, again, invasive of the cavernous sinus on the right, also uh, of the supracellar space, and then post-op, this is what it looked like, but some residual within the cavernous sinus. And then, so along with radiation oncology, he went under hypofractionated gamma knife radio surgery for cavernous, the cavernous sinus residual. It was five fractions, a uh, hypofractionated uh, gamma knife. And uh, this is what it looks like essentially about two years out. And he's actually biochemically in remission. Or are we talking about these types of tumors, which are large, invasive, and have brisk growth? So this is a 50, um, 43-year-old woman with diabetes who presented with headache and nausea and was found to have a non-functioning pituitary at, uh, at microadenoma. She underwent uh, the endoscopic transphenoidal for the midline tumor. And she, on the pathology, she had very brisk cells again, like I was saying. Overall, KI67 proliferation was 4%, okay? And this is what the tumor looked like, both the midline aspect as well as this more lateral cavernous sinus aspect, as you can see here. And so in the first surgery, we cut out the midline aspect. And then unfortunately, we couldn't find where she was for quite some time. And then it turns out that a bunch of it grew even in the midline. And so we performed pretemporal mid middle fossa approach for the cavernous sinus tumor. I guess it's sort of a variation of temporal polar, uh, you could also say. And so we did this on the left side, had this result uh, getting the cavernous sinus portion. She had a um, fourth nerve, which improved to normal. And then after that, we followed that with fractionated radiation therapy. And she, eight years out, is doing uh, reasonably well. Or are we talking about this kind of case? And this is actually a case of Greg Ziffel. And this is a 57-year-old guy who, uh, who had a, a macroadenoma and underwent the endoscopic uh, approach for resection. He, it was a silent corticotrophadenoma. He's ACTH positive, many mitoses, and the KS67, 80% sometimes. So this is uh, Dr. Zipfel, pre-op, post-op, has maybe this tiny residual on the right, and then undergoes gamma knife radio surgery. We see him nine months later. This is, again, post-op. This is amazing, this amount of growth after gamma knife nine months out. Uh, I mean, I, I would certainly call this aggressive. But, you know, I, everyone doesn't have really the same definition of it. So what do we have in terms of formal guidance for about what we call aggressive? So let's go to the WHO. Everyone remembers this, 2004, we had this thing called atypical adenoma, right? Elevated mitotic index, KI67 high, greater than 3%, and then extensive P53 nuclear staining. But people didn't like this for a few reasons. One of them is that it's ambiguous and there were no specific guidelines for what this meant even, like what percent immunoreactivity, P53. And we looked at our own data. And again, this is probably around 2016, 17, when we were looking at this. And we looked at what was considered atypical or typical adenomas. And just as others found, in fact, we found that atypical adenomas didn't do very much worse at all. And this is in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Shikoin. And even if you took out the tumors that got radiated after, you really couldn't see that the atypical adenomas did any worse. And again, other people have shown this to be true. and. Uh, uh, as a result, that's why it was taken out of the WHO 
uh, designations formally in 2017. Now, a big part of 2017 was lineage specific transcription factors. And I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of that in terms of how to define different clinical phenotypes. And they also define these aggressive subtypes, these you know, sparsely granulated somatotrophs, lactotrophs in men, crook cells, silent corticotroph, as I mentioned, and then pluri-hormonal PIT1 positive adenomas, which I think recently Manish Agi showed that it may not actually be as aggressive as we think. And so, you know, 2021 is about to come out. I think the CNS, uh, the, the CNS changes are already out, but I think, uh, you know, the pituitary adenomas are far part of the endocrine section is what some of the pathologists tell me. So the advanced notice is that maybe they were going to start calling pituitary adenomas pituitary neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which frankly might be a little scary for some patients, but that uh, that's going to happen. And then we'll see what other items come. So, and then we have this kind of tumor, right? This adenoma becoming carcinoma. So this is a 53-year-old uh, male who uh, had atypical pituitary adenoma resected in 2004, and then he had recurrent disease and he was resected and then had uh, post-operative fractionated radiotherapy. And then he was later found to have systemic metastases and he was, it was specifically liver metastases. And, and you know, you, we've all seen this entity, it's incredibly rare, but the histology doesn't look any different from other adenomas. It's just that you start having metastases. And so in our institution, I would say over the last 20, 25 years, we've had about eight of these uh, in various buckets according to secretion. Uh, and they are almost universally, they almost universally did, did poorly. I would say six out of eight died within probably five to seven years. Now in a larger series in Germany, seven years out of 4,000 or so pituitary tumors, they had about 10 of them. So that means something like on the order of 0.2%. So pretty rare. And, and again, like I mentioned, the survival is not very good. Five-year survival, at least historically, was about 30 to 35%. But it may actually be changing because the more it seems we use temozolomide, I think the survival is, uh, is just coming up little by little, something I'll mention a little later uh, in the talk. So, you know, an interesting grading system that people have been talking about, I, I would say for the last uh, several years, is this TRUIA grading system. And, uh, and it's interesting, what they were looking at uh, was a bunch of tumors, and they either look for progression or recurrence. And they thought that these parameters, this invasion by NASP grade, or into the sphenoid size and sinus, plus proliferation, it was sort of a variation on the atypical criteria, you know, the K67, P53, and the mitoses, would give you a better sort of predictor for what's going to be aggressive. And so what they said essentially was that most tumors, 50% were these 1A non-invasive type. And then the real bad ones were these two Bs, which were invasive and, and proliferative, having two out of three markers. And that's about seven or 8%. And so if you look at the difference between two B and 1A, the risk of recurrence or progression was something like four to 12 fold. I mean, really very different. And so I think that's interesting. There have been some validations of this uh, of these criteria, and I think uh, it remains uh, to be uh, determined if this is really going to be uh, predictive of real aggression. Because I mean, when it comes down to it, what how are we really going to define an aggressive adenoma? And the European Society of Endocrinology has an interesting definition. I think it's large, radiographically confirmed, invasive lesion with an unusually rapid or clinically relevant growth or uh, recurrence despite optimal standard therapies. I mean, but what, what are we really talking about? Are we talking about the macroadenoma that we you know, cut out with tiny residual and then that grows like several years later and then we remove that little tiny residual or we do gamma and I for that with no further events? Absolutely not. I don't think that's what we're talking about. But the problem is a lot of the literature just scores for that and equates it with others. And so we're looking at our own uh, series here, we're looking at uh, I, I, the non-functioning pituitary adenomas because there's already some great literature on, for instance, the some bad acting corticotrophs, GH secreting. But you know, we generally think that most non-functioning pituitary amino adenomas are gonna do pretty well, right? So we're looking at that set and I have about 228 of them here. And we uh, divided them up. One, 20, one for patients who had three or more treatments. So that means, two or more recurrences, okay? I, I mean, truly aggressive, okay? Not just one recurrence. And then uh, we compared that with people with only one treatment. And then 
because there was a difference in median follow-up, I also made a, uh, another subset of people with just one treatment with longer follow-up, greater than five years. And if you take this as criterion for, uh, for aggressive, you know, and I think that's true, three or more uh, treatments, then it's, it's something to the, on, the, on the order of 10% appear to be aggressive within the normal, uh, the non-functioning pituitary adenoma space. And so uh, we took a, a little closer look at this. And again, this is unpublished and this is just sort of initial thoughts about it. Uh, we did univariate analysis and what comes through is maybe age is interesting, perhaps the KI-67, again, like I said, or maybe the tumor volume. And then in multivariate uh, analysis, what seems to come through is this KI-67 and tumor volume. And these, is, these are things, of course, that people have already talked about in the past. And so it's not a surprise, but you know, the trouble is parameters like that are not very specific, right? So we looked at our KI-67 and each and one of these dots is the KI-67 for a tumor. And so on the left is taking all the one treatment patients. And on the right, it's really looking at the one treatment patients as the control uh, of those patients who are, you know, had the long follow-up greater than five years. And so the KI-67 means are different. You know, this is like 3.8, this is two or something. But the problem is there's such overlap between the, the, the non-aggressive and the aggressive uh, treatments. And the same can be said actually for, for tumor volume, as you can see here. I mean, the, the tumors that tend to need more treatments tend to be bigger. They're like five, 15 cc's or greater, it seems, uh, in, in our series uh, compared to the one treatment. But again, there's this significant overlap, as you can see, even in the long-term follow-up one treatment patients uh, in terms of tumor volumetry. And so I think what's gonna happen is it's it's probably going to be some variation on what Truya have and others have talked about. I mean, it's a lot like what's happening in the molecular space, quite frankly. And there's this, there's a great example of it in the meningioma literature recently by Geller Azada and uh, uh, extremely talented chief resident, uh, uh, Farshad and it's Nisiri, it's a nature paper where they basically take a bunch of different molecular features methylation, RNA, you know, other things, and they just stack them on top of each other. And I think that's what we're going to do with pituitary. I mean, where, whether it's copy number abnormalities like, like Linda B and Ian Dunn have talked about, or, or methylation like, like Gabby Zada has talked about. And then we'll layer these on top of things like, you know, uh, brisk proliferative index and things like that. And I, I think that will give us a better predictor for, for who's going to be really aggressive. So what does that mean? Would this even alter management? I think it would. I mean, if you knew that you had somebody you're going to operate on three times, uh, despite your best efforts, you probably would do, for instance, more frequent monitoring. You might do more radical surgeries early. I think that's very reasonable. Uh, perhaps you would consider early RT after the first surgery. And then I think we need to think more and more about clinical trials. And I know that a lot of people are using more and more temozolomide for, you know, the carcinomas I mentioned, as well as the aggressive adenomas. And there are a number of clinical trials right now uh, that are either just completed or, or, or uh, just about to open. And um, uh, so there are different things we can try. Again, like I said, people are thinking about temozolomide plus RT, for instance, temozolomide with campus cytobine and um, EGFR receptor inhibitors. And then, uh, uh, you know, this is very well known in the melanoma literature and well known to have failed in the glioblastoma literature, but checkpoint inhibitors are also being used in the aggressive adenoma space. Sloan Kettering has uh, this particular study, and I think it's really interesting. It turns out that specific subtypes, for instance, of adenomas like GH secretors and ACTH secretors have more T cells, have more CD8 positive killer T cells. So perhaps these are gonna be working in a certain subgroup of these people. And I think all of this is very interesting and it's just really developing now. And so I think it's important to, uh, to identify who's going to be acting badly, who are the bad actors. We may change our behavior, our management. And I think these clinical trials, you know, precision medicine or immunotherapy is coming for, for these aggressive adenomas. And so thank you very much. Albert, this was such a thoughtful and of course, as always, very intelligent and thoughtful presentation of a tough topic and uh, very few people can analyze this complex topic like you can. So thank you very much. Um, now that you've all created all those CSF leaks, how is Jim Evans going to repair them for you? So Jim, please go ahead and tell us what you've learned through your years of experience about reconstruction techniques and 
again, you're a very thoughtful guy and we, we're looking forward to hearing from you. And years of creating leaks, uh, Jacques. But <laughs> thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> it's great to see you and everybody else in the panel. And Jacques, again, I just want to congratulate you on a, on a great effort. I know it's a, a huge amount of work to put this together, but it's been a great you know, national, international resource. So again, hats off to you. Uh, so I'm going to speak a little bit about reconstruction and pituitary surgery and beyond. Uh, this is our center and, and um, our hospital. And my disclosures and my more important disclosures are that there are many techniques to perform, you know, repair of these uh, defects. There's way too many to address in a short period like this, um, but this just reflects my personal perspective and my experience having done this for a few years. And these are the topics I thought we'd address. And I want to focus a little bit to begin on this because I think we don't give enough attention to this sometimes. Um, to the, the repair of uh, pituitary tumors. You know, they're so common in our practice and we all love the expanded approaches and all getting creative with removal and reconstruction. But I think this deserves attention because it's so, um, it's so common in our, in our practice. And this is just our illustrator's uh, rendition of a pituitary microadenoma, you know, getting dissected and sort of unblock resection. And this is the kind of thing it would look like intraoperatively uh, with this uh, extra capsule dissection, you know, we want to preserve our plane and our capsule and get this sort of unblock removal. But often I, I think what happens is the videos kind of end here. Uh, and what do you do next? Like, where do you, how do you deal with this? And I think it's not discussed enough. You know, if you look at reconstruction techniques, there's gazillions of ways to do this, right? Every center has its own concoction. And however, I, I succeeded last or failed last. And there's fat grafts and thorough substitutes and all sorts of packing and biological glues and nasal septal flaps everywhere. And I, I think it deserves a little attention with, with microadenomas, you know, quote unquote reconstruction, like the one I showed you, I, I just put a simple piece of Surgicel. And the important thing is to not strip all this mucosa from here, be a minimist if you can, you can even mobilize and put mucosa back. But for something like what I showed you, I put a simple piece of Surgicel and this will get bloody and stick in place. And it actually heals quite well. And I can show you this very simple, very cost-effective way to repair something. And this is that same case. You'll see a little piece of Surgicel coming in. Sometimes I'll put two. Sounds very simplistic and uh, you know, maybe country neurosurgeon, but this works in neurosurgery, but it works great. And this will heal quite well. And I can show you this looks like just three weeks post-op. You'll see the turbinate 12 preserved mucosa is in good shape. You'll see the small opening we worked through on the one side. And you'll see this is already mucosalizing quite well because we didn't destroy everything around it a little bit of an acidic environment, a little hyperemic, and it starts to heal quite well. Um, we looked at this also a few years ago in a large number of patients and found that this um, actually works quite well. And our leak rate uh, was 1.1%, which I think is reasonably respectable. The important thing here is that you need to recognize if you have an intra-op CSF leak, this won't hold that back. It's not intended to. Um, but if you can identify a CSF leak um, and uh, recognize you, you don't have one, this repair works great. These were very early in our series as well. Um, so I think this is quite effective and, and very cost effective. So macroadenomas, you know, we often see these soft, poorly developed pseudocapsule tumors, like you've seen in some of the pictures today, where we need a methodical way to go through removing these um, and to try to achieve a gross total resection and decompression of the diaphragm and avoid a leak. And we won't get into the surgical parts of this. This is what it looks like at the end of uh, surgery. Um, some of these may have a well-developed pseudocapsule. And we want to take advantage of that, whether it's partially around the tumor or whether it's circumferentially. And you'll see this at times if you just keep your eyes open and, and dissect carefully. And in this case, you might debulk the center of the tumor and then work in an extra capsular way to achieve the same thing. And this is what that sort of looks like. Let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, with this being debulked initially and then dissecting around the outside of this capsule, kind of taking your time. As I tell my fellows, don't get greedy. Just take your time and work it. It will work off the cavernous sinus on this side and eventually separate the attachments from the diaphragm. And as long as you're careful not to extract the gland with this, you can achieve a very good gross total resection. You'll see the, the cavernous sinus on one side, diaphragm above, um, et cetera. And that's a, a pretty effective way to remove it. And this is the same case uh, here with the post-op um, with nice decompression and, and it's a gross total removal, but how to repair it. So again, if I've got a, a tumor like that with no CSF leak and no patulous or herniating diaphragm from decompression of a very huge tumor, I'll just put a piece of surgis on. I think it works quite well. If we have a CSF leak, if there's a very patulous diaphragm, you know, from a very large tumor that's gonna herniate down through the dura, um, or if we need to put somebody on CPAP, then I'll, I'll turn to a dural uh, substitute and lateral substitute and some biological glue. And uh, like this, this is the uh, graft going in place. You see this diaphragm that would otherwise herniate down and out. 
and then some biological glue like that. And that's what this looks like at the end. Without the need for fat packing, again, it preserved the mucosa around the sides. And it's a pretty minimous way to, to take care of things. And large tumors like this, well up in the third ventricle, you can see we can achieve a very good removal. And that's just a simple repair. It doesn't require fat packing or grafts, autologous tissue or nasal septal flap or that sort of thing. And it's just an example of a macroadenoma coming out, just the tail end, just to save time, irrigation, diaphragm now kind of herniating down or laying down out of here. You know, they cough once and this will kind of push out of the dura. And so the repair is going to be quite simple, just a piece of dural graft. And I don't know if we're allowed to say the name Jacques for CME purposes, but a, a rather firm dural graft. And we'll see that will sit in place and then a little bit of biological glue on top. Mucosa, again, is preserved all around this area, just, just removed what we need for the access to the tumor and a very simple repair. And this will heal quite well. And this is what it looks like after surgery. We keep videos of all of our patients to study how they heal. And you'll see the sinus contents, are, the nasal contents are pretty well preserved. Again, a small opening healing up here. And this is the blue glue here, losing some of its color at a couple of weeks and eventually hydrolyzing in about six weeks. And that heals very, very well and doesn't require other incisions or packing or that sort of thing. And the sinuses, you can see, are pretty healthy. We studied this as well um, a couple of years ago, published a paper on this repair, and our CSF leak rate with this was 1.2%. Again, most of these were in the very early period while we were sort of figuring out how to do this. And so I think this is an effective uh, repair and also reasonably cost-effective, but certainly a little more minim minimalistic than some. And this is a similar kind of case with a, a macroadenoma resected in this kind of a repair. Um, what about CPAP? This is something we study uh, excessively at our place. Um, and we actually put all these repairs into this novel cadaveric model we made for studying CPAP. We've studied all sorts of renditions of CPAP. But in this case, we put all of our various repairs to the test against various pressures in CPAP. And all of these uh, repairs I'm showing you so far, surgicel, except for surgicel, and I'll we'll, we'll show more as we go along, uh, we'll hold back um, CPAP up to you know, the highest, uh, highest settings up in the 20s. And uh, except the, uh, the surgical cell, which breached at 18, which really is not that bad. But we actually have a prospective clinical trial right now uh, underway studying this exact aspect in our, in our patients. And so more to follow um, soon enough. Other cellar options, you know, we've all seen uh, the balloon stabilized graft that UPMC published, which is a, a very multi-layered repair, including some autologous tissue, and then this balloon that sits in place. Downside is I'm not a big fan of the balloon and this stays in place, at least for the report for five or seven days post-op. It doesn't seem like a great way to go around um, with the Foley catheter inside, but it works effectively uh, for them. And then the gasket seal, of course, from Cornell. This uh, large graft is placed in, uh, in, over the uh, defect and then the, some sort of a rigid, you know, bone, cartilage, med pore, something is uh, forced in place to kind of hold this like a, like a, a seal, like a jam jar sort of. Um, and this has been very effective for them. It, they do use a lumbar drain in every case. So how much of this is a real assessment of the repair, I don't know. Uh, these are often covered with nasal septal flap, uh, but certainly require an, uh, a lumbar drain. Uh, but this has worked very effectively for the group um, in Cornell. So a summary of how we repair more or less um, all these cases is surge cell uh, for most for two tridenomas, again, without a leaking diaphragm, without a, a prolapsing or, or a patchless diaphragm. Um, we utilize this inlay dural substitute and glue for, again, the prolapsing or leaking diaphragm or patients that need to go on CPAP. Stay tuned because we're working our way through that with an algorithm right now uh, in a, uh, a clinical trial. And uh, then this idea where the diaphragm is destroyed, tumors like this where it's completely destroyed if a large dual defect or a higher flow leak. Um, then we kind of rely on our, our beloved button. Um, some of you may have heard of this uh, graph that we use, which is a two-layer bilayer repair that's sutured together with two or four, four neuron sutures and placed like this in the dura. And some advantages of this are, it can be made by autologous or synthetic tissue. It's very stable, it doesn't migrate. It doubles the surface area for healing and it conforms to defects with multiple planes like along the planum or the, the uh, tericum cell, et cetera. Um, it doesn't require bony edges. So we don't need to limit our opening and it also doesn't require a rigid strut to force it in place. So we can utilize it around these delicate neurovascular structures like the optic nerves and the, the carotids, et cetera. And then for high flow leaks or very invasive tumors, you'll see tumor like this cactus shaped kind of tumor that's all up around the brain and the ventricles. And this is probably gonna require a little more aggressive repair. And uh, we can always fall back on a nasal septal flap, which we use very selectively. Um, in, our, uh, in our program. Just two comments about this. This is not meant to teach how to do a flap, but one thing is that you can make a wider flap if you need. Many of you uh, know this. Um, you can come down along the, uh, underneath the inferior turbinate up to the lateral wall. And the point of the larger flap is not just have a huge flap, but sometimes you prepare 
your recipient site well, you can make more of a dome with this flap and it tends to sit better without the need for lots of packing and, and, uh, and balloons and that sort of thing. And then we often color purple the mucosal surface. And there are ways to determine, and I teach my fellows how to sort out, you know, not to flip it over or twist the pedicle. I assure you, if you put it up backwards, it does not work. You can ask me later how I know that. Um, but um, coloring it purple will help for orientation purposes so you don't twist, just like you might do in your graft when you're passing a graft through a chest tube shock or wherever you're, you're passing it along for a bypass. And so this is actually something that's helped us. That's a flap going up in place over top of a button there. So what if you perforate or lacerate your flap? Right, it seems deadly. You know, you've got this tear in the center of the flap. It's a redo operation, or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I always joke with our fellows and say, anytime they raise one, they're gonna we're gonna have a perforation. But in all, all, all seriousness, if it's if it's perforated or lacerated, you can still use it. And we studied this a number of years ago and looked at a series of these flaps that were either torn, perforated prior surgery, or had a septal spur. And as long as you position it correctly, um, it'll it'll work well. You're trying to cover the edges of your primary repair. The center usually doesn't tend to leak. That tends to be where the flap is torn or, or the perforation will be. But if you position it correctly, um, it actually can work quite well. So don't get too, too bummed out or, or, or sort of quit on it if you have a, a lacerated or perforated flap. And so just a, a brief summary of, our, of our, um, our algorithm for that. So we'll switch gears a little bit and I'll just talk briefly about uh, transtubercular and transclival surgery. And as we alluded earlier, there's, there's tons of collagen graphs, new, new stuff comes out every week, all sorts of biological glues and free autographs and more and more and pedicle vascularized autographs, as you know, the mesoceptal flap, et cetera, and even suturing techniques that we utilized um, for a while. And there's about as many different techniques um, for repairing these high flow leaks or, or expanded approaches as there are centers doing the surgery, I'm, I'm quite sure. But there's some common underlying themes. And for these high flow leaks, um, the, 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 the common theme is that usually it's first repair with some form of primary stable dural repair and some sort of mucosal coverage, often a vascularized flap, uh, often in the, in the form of a nasal septal flap, but others as well. And this, this combination seems to be the, the greatest success when you look across the board to different centers. Again, our, our beloved uh, button graft. Uh, we make the inlay about 25% larger than the dural defect. It gives a good surface area to hold it in place. And we make the onlay just larger than the dural defect because I like to have dura exposed around the edges of an onlay. So my nasal septal flap or whatever graft I'm putting down is in direct communication with dura. I think vascularized tissue on vascularized tissue heals the best. And then this is sutured together, as I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, this is a synthetic version. And so these can be made out of synthetic uh, as well. Um, it depends on the, the specific case, but this is just a synthetic graft being tucked in place, a bilayer graft again. You'll see it's very stable. It's not moving back and forth. We don't see leakage around it. And then we'll cover this with a nasal septal flap once it's all settled in place. And I'll just skip ahead again a little bit so we don't get too far behind. But this is a typical flap that you're aware of. And this has to sit nicely approximated. Again, use a, a cottonoid pad or whatever it takes to make sure this is all approximated. As long as you've prepared that surface, you'll see it'll sit pretty well. I don't need to pack a lot of things inside here to make that hold up. And we may just seal the edges with a little bit of biological glue or sometimes put a nasopore in the center if needed. This can be made out of uh, fascia lata as well, which is where we started with most of this. Um, and for our giant and uh, recurrent invasive tumors, uh, like I showed earlier, this particular case and some others here. Um, we studied this as well, and our leak rate utilizing this technique is 1.8%. Uh, and I think that's pretty good for some of these giant uh, tumors that you know are pretty destructive or in the third ventricle, et cetera. Uh, this is a, a craniopharyngioma, um, as you've seen in some of the other uh, videos, and similar kind of thing. This is at the end of the removal. You know, this, this is uh, the defect at the end, the uh, third ventricle, et cetera, uh, harvesting fascia lata. And uh, I've got an endoscopic way of doing this that I've been kind of working on. I know one other center was doing something similar. Um, and I'll just skip up here. This is it on the back table. It'll be uh, sutured together again with, in this case, four, four neural on sutures, partial thickness on either side. So we don't make a fistula through the graft. And then when this is uh, finished, we'll color the onlay purple. It'll sit like this in the dural defect ultimately. And so here's the graft coming in place. I sped this up a little bit um, just so, it doesn't take too much time, but you'll see this inlay getting tucked in place and you can actually manipulate this because it's sutured together. And by moving the onlay back and forth, it actually helps that inlay to unfurl nice and flat for the best surface area and the least compression. And so once that's settled in place, you'll see it'll pulse like dura and it'll kind of sit nicely there. We won't see leaks around it. You know, it's sealed when it starts to pulse well. And then that'll get covered in this case um, with the nasal septal flap. 
And there's our cartoon of the flap and the sort of flap coming up in position. And again, sometimes we'll put some biological glue around the edges. That's probably the most superfluous part of this. Probably a little bit of blood does just as well. And then we can put a nasopore or something in the center if you feel you need a little bit of, uh, a little something to reinforce it. And this, that same case, you'll see the button graft sits in this position. Here's a nasal septal flap up in position and you know, tumor section as you expect. And our leak rate for this in our initial series we wrote a while back um, was about 4%, which I thought was still pretty good. That was early on. We've got now three different um, cohorts um, of, of patients over time. And in our, in our latest uh, our group, it was less than 2%. And we're just in the process of analyzing our most recent um, cohort of craniopharyngiomas. And so that's, uh, I think, a, a, good, um, a good rate. Same for tuberculum cell meningioma. Um, this may not have the third ventricle open and other constraints of a craniopharyngioma, but a very similar repair you'll see here um, with the button graft in place and then a nasal septal flap um, for the uh, mucosal repair. And this is something else we published, same, same kind of thing with very similar outcomes for, uh, for leak rates. I mentioned nasopore. This is useful. We use it in two main places. One is to keep the middle turbinates medialized. So we keep the, the um, middle meatus um, you know, draining well and without obstruction. And um, we also sometimes use it in the center of a graft to give a little bit of um, support. As you know, this turns down to a gel or liquid in just a matter of a week or so, a week or two. Usually by the next week, we suction that out. Uh, Foley balloon, another way to support things, not a big fan. You know, I think mucosal damage and flap ischemia, we've seen cases that have come from other centers with alar necrosis. Um, and it can be just sort of painful for a patient to have that in the nose and, and, and sometimes being discharged or walking around with that in the nose. So transclival defects, this is really why we created um, the button graft. Uh, Mark Rosen and I were, were you know, battling repairing the uh, transclival tumors like this chordoma. And we found that the inlay graft would slide away, the onlay graft would follow by gravity. And it was kind of a challenging place to work. And, uh, and I'll show you, I've got a video um, in a second. This is our, our illustrator's rendition of that hole in the clivus, but this is a, a video um, of that same chordoma. And you'll see this is intradural clearly, and it's going up into the interpeduncular fossa like here. Um, so, so it's going to have a large defect uh, already through the dura. Um, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. There's a lot to, to do here in the nose, and, and parts of the tumor were already uh, eroded uh, through. Um, let's kind of keep skipping along. And you'll see there's a big defect eventually taking soft portions of the tumor out. We line this with patties so we don't see the nose and try to reduce that as much as possible and have to drill every surface you come upon where there was tumor, as you know. But eventually you'll see this is large defect that was already here. We need to resect all this dura around the edges. So it's gonna be larger. Here's the uh, resection of that. And then eventually we've got to deal with the intradural portion of this tumor. And we'll be dissecting it off all these critical structures. Again, it's, we're not here for the resection. I just wanna get up to the end here. Um, teasing it off all these you know, basal perforators, et cetera, on the front of the brainstem. And eventually you get this cavity that'll be pretty cleared up uh, as you'll see. And so we have to now fix this hole. So I tend to use my, um, pituitary or various things to, to, to determine the size that I need to repair. I'll create my button graft as we discussed. Here it is in place starting to pulse without a whole lot leaking through it. And then we're gonna lay our nasal septal flap on top. I'll talk about dead space in just a minute, um, but we'll put our nasal septal flap up on top. You can see the size sits very nicely again, doesn't need to be pushed or packed so much. A little bit of blue glue around the edges or biological glue of some sort um, can be helpful. And then sometimes a central piece of nasopore and it's simple as that. And that'll, that'll liquefy in a week or so, and then you're just left with the primary repair. So not a lot of packing. And this is what that looks like after surgery, the button graft in place in this uh, nasal septal flap. I think I've got the pictures here, yeah. So um, one thing is this dead space. Beware of that with this or with odontoidectomy. You know, sometimes you can have a dead space here. And this is one of the few places I used to use fat was just to fill this dead space so that my flap wasn't going across air and to keep um, just, just some kind of... Uh, compression against the primary door repair. And the same in the, in the odontoid, sometimes a big dead space down here, not only um, can have the problem with the flap not laying flat against it, but you can get volume loss and you can develop VPI and problems with nasal regurgitation, et cetera. Um, but largely this is just a button graft and a nasal septal flap if there's a large dead space. Now I put a couple of pieces of gel foam in there if needed. And uh, this is that sort of uh, cartoon rendition of a flap and uh, a button graft I mean in place either gel foam or something in the dead space um, if needed, and then a nasal septal flap nicely approximated. You need to prepare all these mucosal surfaces um, as well before you place that. And then what about lumbar drains? So we don't tend to use lumbar drains for almost anything. 
except if we're doing a repair for a patient that potentially has pseudotumor cerebri or some kind of a high pressure with a, a meningoencephalocele, that sort of thing, we might tap or put a drain while we're sorting that part out. Um, even if we have a leak post-op, we tend to just take patients back to surgery and repair it, uh, find out what the problem is, what the carpentry issue was, and, and fix the, uh, the leak. But these guys, uh, UPMC did a study on this. They did their uh, own uh, center, uh, did a prospective randomized uh, trial looking at lumbar drains. And their CSF leak rate went down. It was, it was effective for them, went from you know, 21 plus percent down to about 8.2%. So in their hands, they felt that the lumbar drain made a big difference. I would venture to say that I think our leak rates are lower than that without a drain, but whatever their repair technique is, was clearly augmented by the lumbar drain. And so they've promoted that. And I'm not sure how many other centers have, have followed along, uh, but we don't tend to rely on drains. And just a couple more topics I'll go through very briefly is other repair options. You know, what if you have a nasal septal flap or other tissues that you're used to using? And I'll just go over briefly a TPF, pericranium, and vascularized free flap. Now, TPF is, is particularly great graft, and it's, it's very familiar with head and neck surgeons. It's used for a lot of repairs, like microtia and static slings for the face and temporal bone defects, et cetera. It's a very reliable, very large graft. It's got a, an excellent uh, arc of rotation. You know, it's based on the, the uh, STA. And uh, this graft can reach a lot of places and can be made of a very large volume. It's got some advantages. It's constant. Again, arc rotation is excellent. It's got a very long vascular pedicle. It's a very vascularized tissue. It can be super for avoiding infection or treating uh, osteonecro uh, osteonecrosis or, or um, um, osteoradionecrosis. Um, it's a pretty thin and pliable thing. And what's important about this is you can not only pass it places, but unlike a nasal septal flap, you can fold this. You can tuck it in multi-layers, you can wrap it around things, you can cover it with mucosa if you want, because it doesn't have a mucosal surface. So it's very important, it's, it's a very uh, versatile graft. There's um, some disadvantages. You know, it's a large external incision, uh, often a visible scar on their head potentially. There's definite potential for alopecia, and you're dissecting on the gailey, et cetera. Um, and you have to watch your frontal branch as well. Um, so just some potential drawbacks, but it can really save you in a pinch. And we did a study on this as well, uh, published a year or two ago, just looking at the volume that was necessary to cover various defects. I won't belabor this, but you can look at this paper and we sort of figured out you know, how large a graft you need to cover various parts of the cranial base, whether you'd need one for both sides or how you can you know, use it in combinations, et cetera. This is the uh, pericranial flap, very useful as well. This is a paper by Zenation and the guys at UPMC when they were working on an endoscopic harvest technique for pericranium to make a large graft. Um, many centers don't do this endoscopically now and make a small incision just to, just to mobilize it so you don't tear it. Um, it's a bit of a struggle endoscopically, but it can be done. And then a little incision and opening the glabella and then passing this uh, inside. And so if you've got a, a far anterior cranial base a defect or you know, as large as you really need to make it, you can get some pretty good coverage of the cranial base. And in a, in a pinch, in a case like anesthesia or something where you don't have any other tissue, um, this can be very helpful. And then lastly, uh, free flap. Uh, so we sometimes need to fall back on some form of a free flap. Uh, this is a patient that had an MPC treated with osteoradial necrosis. You can see the clivus is eroded away with some exposure to the carotid artery. And uh, she didn't have other tissue. There's no nasal septal flap available. TPFs are not healthy enough. And so she needed ultimately to be debrided and have a free flap. And we chose a um, radial forearm uh, flap. This is a very long pedicle, as you know. It's pretty, pretty good for the working in this space. You can take off the epithelium and deepithelialize it and pass it through a Caldwell lock. And in this case, we had to look for some vessels as well because she'd been radiated, as you can imagine, and we used facial artery and vein to anastomose this. And this is what it looks like when it's sitting in place. This is pre-op, and you can see post-op, it's got great coverage, nice vasculature in that space to help to heal this uh, osteoradial necrosis. And this will shrink about 20 or 30%, um, but you see it's not obstructing your nasopharynx. It's sitting kind of nicely in that position. So this can be effective, and you can get very creative with various types of uh, of free flaps as a, as a backup plan. Maybe not the everyday plan, but, but certainly useful to have uh, when you're in a pinch. And that's it. So thanks very much. I'll be happy to take questions or listen on to the next great talk. Uh, thank you, Tom Cruise. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim Evans. Jim Evans, thank you so much for this presentation. See how it came to me? <laughs> you're a much more attractive version of him and certainly a lot more intelligent, but thank you. That was phenomenal. Both, Jacques, both of those mean a lot to me coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was great. You covered really everything about reconstruction and uh, 
I'm sure I can see from the comments of the audience, very well received. By the way, to the speakers, if you go to the chat or the QA box and you see a specific question addressed to you and you would like to answer uh, the person asking it, go ahead and type your answers. We will leave many of the questions for uh, at the end, but feel free if there are some simple questions you want to answer. And last but not least, again, I, I thank uh, Lee for taking time uh, a few days prior to his 25th wedding anniversary to join us today. And thank you for coming down to Florida to celebrate it in a few days. Uh, Lee, talk to us about, are we screwing up the nose uh, a lot or are we not paying enough attention to what goes on with the quality of life after endonasal surgery? Thanks, Lee. Well, thank you, Jacques. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. And yes, very good. So first of all, I have no conflicts of interest. I, I want to definitely thank Jacques for inviting me to be the token otolaryngologist at this meeting. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I um, trained at the University of Pittsburgh from 2000, actually 1999 till 2004, and then was Carl Snyderman's first uh, head and neck skull base endoscopic skull base fellow and was kind of the pioneer back then and saw a lot of very interesting stuff occurring in Pittsburgh at the time, which has fortunately been uh, refined by not just Pittsburgh, but many other, other individuals, including Jim Evans, who I've known for a long time and really appreciate the work that he has done in Pennsylvania. So when, just to give you a little historical background, when I was looking for a job back in the day that I said I was an endoscopic skull base surgeon. Everybody looked at me like I had four heads. Uh, there were uh, three institutions at the time in 2004 that were interested in this new novel technique. One was um, Loyola University up in Chicago, the University of Washington out in Seattle in my hometown of Cincinnati. Jack Gluckman was the chair there at the time. And I knew Jack who was the uh, president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology. Uh, and he says, I, th you know, I think we should look into this. So I came down to the interview at the University of Cincinnati and this gentleman here, Kevin Shumrick, who did all of the sublabial approaches, the microscopic approaches for neurosurgery at the University of Cincinnati at the time said, dude, you're ruining the nose. You are ruining the nose. So he was my inspiration in many ways of looking into are we ruining the nose? If we are ruining the nose, how can we not ruin the nose with these approaches? And I'm mostly just going to talk about the pituitary approach because that, that was what was probably at the time the most accepted, the thing that was being accepted in 2004 as a possible breakthrough for um, endoscopic skull-based approaches. So we're not going to talk about the Clival or, or any of the other expanded approaches, though I will give a little comment on the on the uh, nasal septal flap. And I think Jim Evans is dead on that the wider the flap you have, in other words, the most exposed bone you have, you want to uh, cover as much as that bone as possible for not only stopping postoperative CF, uh, CSF leaks, but also regaining normal function of nasal physiology. So our goal is look at the evidence and or lack thereof. And again, I'm speaking from the standpoint of about 15 years ago, but as an otolaryngologist and a lot of times neurosurgeons don't think about this, we think about nasal physiology. And what does the nose do? It makes a lot of mucus. And so this is a picture, I think you can hopefully see my cursor over this, a picture of the maxillary sinus and this is the flow of mucus through it to the natural ostium in the maxillary sinus. And so it has a physiology, a flow rate. There are cilia that move mucus in the appropriate, appropriate direction to move into the nasal cavity down to our throats where it mixes with saliva and allows us to have a moist throat for swallowing, which we all enjoy very much. It also has some other, other roles in that it's part of the immune system. So as we all know that the nasal cavity, we breathe through, we wanna trap a lot of, of, of viruses and bacteria and destroy them early on. And then again, the viscosity of being allowed to breathe through the nose or swallow. 
So, whoop, going the wrong way here. My mouse is backwards. So, here are some other flow tracks. So, what I want to really concentrate on in this talk is not from the frontal sinus or the maxillary sinus, but from the sphenoid sinus. And the sphenoid has a natural ostium that's located about right here with the mouse. And that is about midway to the lower mid third of the superior turbinate. So mucus flows out through here and down the throat. So whenever we wanna think about how we're gonna access the sphenoid sinus in the pituitary gland area, we wanna concentrate on that natural ostium. Early on, I saw some patients come back to me after microscopic approaches and they entered in but left the natural ostium. So what happens in that situation is a recirculatory effect where the mucus flows out and then goes back into the unnatural hole. So you get a chronic sinusitis situation there and back bacterial buildup. This is what cilia look like under electron microscopy. So this is kind of like seaweed in the ocean. It flows back and forth, back and forth in a kind of random fashion. But what it does is flows mucus from our sinuses down to our nasopharynx. Again, when this is working appropriately, everything is happy in the nose. So our goal when we think about these procedures is how do we preserve this in the situation of endoscopic skull base surgery? And, and again, Jim Evans really provided a nice talk about that, preserve mucosa, pre preserve mucosa. But when we can't, how do we replace it? So what's the role of nasal physiology? So the nasal airway. So this is looking at the, uh, the uh, nasal airway on the left. So you have the septum here, the inferior turbinate, which moisturizes airflow, captures particles, and senses airflow. Here's the middle turbinate. This is what happens when the nasal cavity gets dry. So if you remove structures within the nose, you can cause a severe drying effect. You can see all this old crusty mucus forming along the inferior turbinate here, which in this picture has been partially resected, the middle turbinate and the septum. If we're not careful, when we approach through the nasal cavity, we can get sneaky or scarring between the septum and the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, causing uh, nasal obstruction in the nose which is very bothersome to patients. So why do we have a nasal cavity? Well, one of the reasons is olfaction. When we smell things, obviously the best place to put the receptors for the sense of smell is right in the front, in the superior nasal cavity. So we have to be careful about olfaction. And that's true for pituitary approaches, because if you look at my cursor here coming through the nostril up towards the cella, we, get, we encroach upon the nerves for the sense of smell who come through the cribriform plate here, come down onto the septum, but they also come onto the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate. So taking these structures, we have to be careful about, and we should preserve them when we can. There was a nice study uh, out, which I had a hard time finding uh, recently, but I read about 10 years ago, where they compared sinonasal outcome uh, studies or SNOT, sinonasal olfactory tests, looking at partial resection of the superior turbinate and found no difference between patients who had a partial resection of that turbinate versus patients who did not. So this is one structure we can be a little aggressive with on a traditional pituitary approach. Just another picture with those olfactory fibers coming down on the superior turbinate. So when I look at maximal exposure and preserving function, we want to look at what do we need to remove. So here is a sagittal section looking at the cella here, okay, middle turbinate, inferior turbinate, anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, posterior ethmoids here. This is the area we want to really focus upon to give us broad exposure to the sphenoid sinus. And I will attest that you can provide that wall-to-wall -wall floor to ceiling approach with just the removal of these structures. And I'll show you some videos in a second. And here is the central component that we want to remove. I'm going to show you my techniques on the preserve as much mucosa as you can on this approach.
All right, so my approach is first, we want to lateralize the middle turbinate. So here we are looking into the left nasal cavity. Here's the septum, here's the middle turbinate, here's the lateral wall. We want to lateralize the middle turbinate here, preserve that, and then you start to see the superior turbinate coming into view. And here's the superior turbinate. Then you want to lateralize that superior turbinate, and then you'll see the natural ostium of the sphenoid sinus. And you don't always see this, but when I operate in the uh, nose, both for sinus surgery and for skull base surgery, I use one to 1,000 uh, adrenaline pledgets, which really decongests the sphenoethmoid recess in this area right here. And most of the time I get a very good visualization of this natural ostium. And it's very important because you wanna make sure when you look into the sphenoid, when you open this region here, that you have the natural ostium involved with that entire opening where you can get the recirculation effect that I talked about earlier. Here's just some uh, cartoon drawings that Dr. Corral gave me before I left. I think he gave me like 1200 drawings and other videos before I left in 05. Just looking, this is the uh, right nasal cavity we're looking into now. Actually, sorry, the left nasal cavity we're looking into now with the middle turbinate, superior turbinate, they are lateralized. There's the natural ostium. Here's the posterior septal artery running across here to the um, septum here on the left, uh, which is uh, very important to preserve for the possible use of the septal flap. Here's a picture interoperatively that Rick gave me uh, about 15 years ago. Here we are opening up the natural ostium of the sphenoid sinus. And here's a video that I took. So the middle turbinate, superior turbinate has been lateralized. I've opened up the natural ostium of the sphenoid sinus here. And now you're looking, this is on the left. Here's the OCR. So very nice visualization of that approach on the left side. Again, this is uh, utilizing 1-1000 adrenaline pledges, which to not fear neurosurgeons, I do not use that once we open up the cellar face. Here's on the right side, again, lateralization of the middle turbinate, superior turbinate, showing a nice view of the sphenoid sinus. Now, as long as you stay low on the middle turbinate when you're lateralizing it, I've never had a fracture of the middle turbinate at the skull base. It is a possibility. So you wanna stay nice and low, 30 degree angle from the, the nostrils back to the sphenoid sinus to do this without going superior up into here and lateralizing and fracturing at the skull base. So once we have that natural ostium opened up, we wanna remove that anterior face, give nice wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Here's again a, a picture from Rick uh, back in the day and I'll show you newer videos soon. So here's a video on the right nasal cavity. I've, I've lateralized everything, opened up the sphenoid sinus. And now I do what uh, the Pittsburgh group uh, showed for a rescue flap. So I, using a endoscopic a needle tip bovi, I basically cauterize from the at opening of the sphenoid sinus back to the anterior wall, the, the, sorry, the anterior tip of the middle terminate. And then I just make a little incision below the posterior septal artery is running right through here where I'm rolling with my mouse. And this just helps me liberate some tissue to protect this mucosa. I really wanna protect all of this mucosa here and all this mucosa here where the olfactory fibers live. Again, as we open up, oop, going wrong way again, sorry about that. So once I have that cautery performed, I take a caudal elevator and just gently tease this mucosa inferiorly. And I'll just speed through this a little bit for time's sake. I'm continuing to work that inferiorly. The inferior cut below the posterior septal artery allows me to get a little more arc of rotation here. Now I'm gonna pause this a second. So when I create this window inferiorly, and I'll also do it superiorly. When this heals postoperatively from the anterior portion of that cautery, it's almost like a zipper effect. All this mucosa will slowly heal posteriorly to the sphenoid sinus 
So when I see them in the office about a month, well, I see them a week later, but when I see them in a month, it's almost like I was never there except for a sphenoidotomy. So it's a really nice approach. And then the superior mucosa here, up here, and this isn't a great picture of it, this tissue goes from pink to white. And the reason why it goes white is it becomes more neural fibers. And so that's the tissue we wanna preserve for olfaction. All right. So here our uh, mucosa has been uh, retracted inferiorly. I have a suction, a Fraser suction down here to protect it. And I can now go uh, as aggressive as I wanted to to remove all of this bone of the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. The posterior septal artery is protected in the retracted tissue uh, by my Fraser suction. Now, this is the superior turbinate here. You can see I have bipolar cautery on that because I know from the uh, prior studies that sacrificing this inferior half of the superior turbinate has no effect long-term on olfaction. So I'm gonna cauterize that. And then what I'm gonna do is open up the posterior ethmoid cells. Now the posterior ethmoid cells flow also through the sphenoid, sphenoethmoid recess. So doing this, without going lateral to the middle turbinate to open up the ethmoids is fair game based on physiology. Now I gotta be careful there. You saw that my mucosa kind of flipped up because of the suction, but here I am all in the lateral wall of the right sphenoid sinus with that technique. Then we're gonna remove the posterior bony septum, has no, no role, no support uh, as far as nasal uh, anatomy or cosmetics. So we're going to remove that. And then I have the vomer, which we will remove. And I always start by removing superiorly. It's a very thin bone. Uh, it, it comes away with the kerosene ron drawer easily without violating the, the roof or the plain sphenoid alley. And then I'll fast forward here a little bit. So I'm coming across. A lot of times I will protect the mucosa of the septum with Fraser suctions, which allows me to get my kerosene in without worry of violating either the posterior septal artery or the mucosa. And then I'll take that bone out for possible reconstructive purposes at the uh, end of the procedure. And then once we have completed that, we have this broad view of the sphenoid sinus, the cella, the carotid arteries bilaterally. You can go all the way up to the plenum sphenoid alley and inferiorly. And I, I have to reemphasize with Jim Evans that uh, protecting as much mucosa as you can within the sphenoid sinus leads to better outcomes long term for the function and physiology of the sinuses and nasal cavity. This is just a picture, I'll, I'll play it here, of a septal flap. Eh, it doesn't look like it wants to play, but that's okay. It just showed the pulsations. Again, this was a case where we had a high flow CSF leak because I did the rescue technique with the septal flap at the beginning of the case. Um, I had that available. And at the end, we played that, uh, placed that in. So Jim talked about the malleability of, of flaps. They're very malleable. You just have to be patient. So when we layered this back, I, I, I use a lot of uh, half inch pledgets and I just gently press against here with the pledgets over time. So I'll place a pledget here in the center, put a Fraser suction over it and just kind of move it out and just kind of spread out this surface slowly, just making it very uh, in conformity with the skull base. And I think that really helps long-term with coverage of the exposed bone. And once this heals, the physiology of the sphenoid sinus. I've, I've never seen this flap cause long-term chronic sinusitis. The cilia figure it out. They allow, once it heals, to flow through the sphenoid sinus to the sphenoid ethmoid recess and uh, down to the nasopharynx and pharynx. And I also agree, I, I never liked, I, gosh, you know, I was there in the early days in Pittsburgh where everybody had a Foley catheter up the nose. And my concern was I've yet to see a study where this nasal septal flap has shown a good venous outflow, which always makes me amazed how well it works for us. 
so this is so I, I don't use any foley's at all i use this is nasopore uh from striker industry uh, i just like it because it works great you place it in there it slowly expands and just gives a little back pressure up against your repair and i've never seen this give enough pressure to cause a congested flap and or a dead flap so that's what i use and i just spray a little tissue sealant over this at the end of the case so all factions so Around 2007, with the help of Dr. Philip Fetisopoulos, who's the vice chair of neurosurgery now at uh, University of California, San Francisco, we, we looked at a prospective uh, study of olfaction using the University of Pennsylvania. Hey, Jim, that's for you as you are, uh, smell identification test. And we enrolled 56 patients, 25 men, 31 women, age range 19 to 76. We excluded, obviously, anybody who uh, preoperatively had anosmia, known or unknown. We found it through our testing. Eight failed to complete the study. So um, we uh, looked for a 25% change in olfaction to be assumed significant. And we assumed that 10% change in olfaction would be detected by the patient. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the UPSET study, it's essentially 46 scratch and sniff questions. So you, you scratch the the olfactant, you smell it, you have A, B, C, and D, and you mark down what you think you're smelling. And if you score a zero, you're lying, uh, just by statistics. Uh, if you're anosmic, you would score about 25%. Uh, and if you had perfect sense of smell, you would score 100%. And these were our results. And it was interesting to me because before we did this study, Everybody at one month that came into my office, or not everybody, but mostly everybody said, I can't smell a darn thing. But when you challenge them with the uh, University of Pennsylvania smell identification test, uh, at baseline, they were around the 34. At one month post-op, they dropped down to a 30. So this is a very, you know, 10, 20% change in the sense of smell. And then at three months, they all recovered back essentially to baseline. But again, everybody told you here they couldn't smell a darn thing, but they really weren't down that far. But I, uh, my assumption is that they just had a hard time from a neural standpoint understanding um, what they were smelling, though when you were challenged, they were able to do that well. So then what we did is the, wanted to look at physiology of just basic sinonasal quality of life. So we did SNOT 22 studies. Uh, this time, 36 patients enrolled, um, 25 men, 31 women, again, a similar age range, age range. None were excluded in the study and none failed to complete the study. And again, we looked at pre-op one in three months post. And again, we used 10%, or for this study, we used 10% change in score deemed significant. And here's our results. So pre-op, uh, most people, you gotta remember, I live in Cincinnati, which is kind of a uh, allergy capital of the world. Uh, we were looking around a score of 27%. Uh, so the higher the number, the worse their score results are. At one month, they actually increase their uh, or decrease their quality of life from a sinonasal standpoint. And the interesting thing was at three months, they were actually much better. And I'll explain that here in just a second as far as why this this uh, sinonasal quality of life study questionnaire would cause improvement in their overall quality of life. So if you look at this graph here, it's kind of a busy graph, but we'll, we'll kind of summarize it. Uh, we did pre-op in the dark gray, one month in the light gray, and three months in the intermediate. And what we found was <clears throat> at one month, Typical things we would expect in these patients was worse. Need to blow your nose because we tell them they can't. Sneezing, they're scared to, we tell them they shouldn't. Runny nose, you know, we've, we've operated in the mucosa of the sinuses, so the outflow of mucus is decreased, so they feel a thicker postnasal drip. Postnasal drip correlates with the runny nose part, thick nasal uh, drainage. But what was interesting is the things in blue, which, which improved greatly at three months, 
but most of them were more of the psychological aspects of having bad cyanonasal quality of life. And that's waking up tired, fatigued, uh, frustrated, waking up at night. And we really qualified that to just the psychology of, I have a brain tumor. I'm scared. You're going to do surgery in my brain. And then afterwards, three months, I survived the surgery on my brain. I'm doing great. I didn't have any bad complications and I've improved. So that's all, all good here. And then when you look at the sense of uh, taste and blockage, obviously the sense of taste goes with olfaction. We all know that you lose your sense of smell, you lose your sense of taste the vast majority of the times. Uh, that was down at one month greatly as things are trying to heal and improve within um, uh, significance three months and then blockage and congestion. Again, as the sinonasal lining is healing, uh, congestion is very prominent, but again, uh, basically resolves back to baseline in three months. So we looked at a couple other studies that came out after ours, which basically agreed with that. Uh, Siobhan et al., uh, American Journal of Rhinology and Allergy in 2015, looked also at the uh, University of Pennsylvania Smell Identification chest, uh, Test and looked at uh, pre-op and three to four months out with no change in olfactory scores. Um, we looked at uh, with the nasal septal flap by Harvey et al., Journal of Neurological Surgery in 2015, olfactory loss after septal flap, zero uh, month pre-op versus six months. They did SNOP tw SNOT 22 and the upset 40, no change in olfaction, no change in nasal function. Um, and then there was another study done by Rioja at all European archives of otolaryngology in 2015, standard pituitary with middle turbinate preservation versus expanded with uh, resection of the middle turbinate and uh, nasal septal flap. And they use uh, a, a couple of different quality of life questionnaires. And pretty much when you look at their overall groups, the uh, regular transphenoidal groups uh, did well pre and post-op. The expanded transphenoidals were a little worse off after surgery. And that kind of qualified throughout these studies that the um, expanded transphenoidals did a little worse off than the uh, typical pituitary approach, particularly in smell loss and posterior discharge and pressing. Now, obviously since 15, we've come a long way of, of how we're treating these. And I'm glad to see that neurosurgeons are thinking about this on their reconstruction. I think we're gonna to continue to improve on these. And, and just remember that these studies excluded uh, anterior cranial fossa, because obviously we're going to have a significant effect on the sense of smell and those type of procedures. So my lessons are respect the natural osteo, preserve all factory fibers. Uh, again, I'm, I'm stating this mostly for pituitary, expanded pituitary procedures. Uh, the pleasure of food and drink can't be underestimated. The patients, when they lose their sense of smell, uh, their quality of life is affected significantly. Uh, they can lose weight, they can uh, be in danger. There's studies showing that the loss of sense of smell actually uh, decreases our life expectancy. So it's a, it's a big deal. They can uh, eat and drink uh, spoiled food products, the natural gas in the home can be undetected. So this is a very important thing. Co cover exposed bone and cartilage with lichen-like tissues. So when you take out mucosa, you want to cover it with mucosa. It's a very important thing and try to limit unlike tissues. I mean, we do highly rely upon when we use tensor fasciolata and other things that the mucosa around it's going to heal and grow over that and provide normal function. It's not always going to. Uh, so please use it as sparingly as possible. Obviously, we all use it when we have to but we have to keep that uh, in consideration. Inclusions, respect the anatomy and the physiology. Respect mucus production and flow, uh, humidification, olfaction, and airflow through the nose. So I thank you very much for your attention. These are old pictures of my daughters playing soccer. This, this guy, girl right here plays in the National Leagues now, keeping me busy when I'm not working. And this girl now is one of the top cross-country runners in the United, in Ohio. 
So thank you very much. And yes, there is life outside of what we do. Here I am I coaching the uh, third and fourth grade uh, soccer team at my grade school to a city championship. They don't look excited, do they, folks? So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Lee, very much. And that, uh, that rhinology perspective was indeed uh, very much needed to, to bring the whole session really together. Um, if you stop sharing your slides, uh, you know, I, we were going to show, I was going to ask David, my fellow, to show a case, but we are running late. And David, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to uh, skip your, your presentation. But uh, Jean, I, I, Jean, I can I ask, can I ask, make a comment if, if you have a second while we're transitioning? Oh, yeah, we don't know. We're not transitioning. Now, now ah. is, the session is open to talk, comments, answer questions. So you, you go ahead, lead the way. I just have a, I, I saw a question come up and I'll try to answer it, but I also wanted to just um, ask Lee something. Lee, by the way, congratulations on 25 years. Uh, and I, I just have a question for you. As far as olfaction, this may be very relevant to this uh, day and age, um, right, with COVID, et cetera. Are, are you doing anything or do you have any insight on anosmia with uh, either vitamin A or platelet-rich plasma or that sort of thing. Do you have any, any thoughts or comments on that? We, we have some trials going here and I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are as far as it applies to this you know, post-surgical patient like you described or to even COVID. No, I mean, I have not seen convincing data um, for any type of intervention for anosmia post-viral, post post-surgical beyond olfactory physical therapy. And what do I mean by that? That means you tell the patient, keep in your mind what that used to smell and taste like. And so you're trying to train your brain to reconnect with the peripheral fibers. And that actually has some data. It's not great because you're trying to overcome a system that doesn't regenerate very well. But it seems to have some effect on viral insults. You know, we've known for years that viruses can cause olfactory deficit. That's not a new thing. I, I think a lot of the general population, the lay population thinks that, but that's not true. We've been seeing that for years from just the common flu. It's just less prevalent than it seems to be with, with coronavirus. But with surgery, it's, it's a different ballgame in many ways, right? We're either causing a conductive loss. We talk about conductive loss in hearing, as you know, Jim. Um, uh, from surgery where you cause scarring and other things, you're never going to overcome that because the only way to release the scarring is to destroy the olfactory fibers. So you want to prevent it to begin with, but you're also removing the fibers and we're not mice, you know, it, re it, re it, it regenerates in mice. It doesn't regenerate in us very well. So, so really, I don't think there's any medical treatment for this beyond just trying to retrain your brain to deal with the limited fibers you have left. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, I saw a question that went by asking about free mucosal grafts, the use of free grafts. I, I just lay that out to any, any of us, but I'll just answer briefly for, my, for myself. I'm not a big fan of free mucosal grafts. I know you can use them in, in these creative ways to utilize. I don't use it on a regular basis. Um, one of the things I get concerned about is where we're taking the graft from. You know, if you resect the middle turbinate on a regular basis, you might want to open it like a book and lay it down or wrap it around the back of your septum or lots of of utility, but I don't tend to resect any tissue unless it's involved in the pathology. So we try to really minimize uh, resection of middle turbinate, for instance, or premucosal grafts from elsewhere that may cause bony exposure and, and some of the concomitant troubles that, that uh, Lee has alluded to. Um, so I think it's important to try to protect as much normal structure and function as you can so you don't um, disrupt you know, normal synonasal um, function. But uh, I'll just leave it open to everybody else. If you have any thoughts on premucosal graft, if, if you take it on a regular basis or, or what you might use it for. I mean, we use it when we don't have anything else to use, you know, either a free turbinate uh, mucosal uh, graft, uh, very rarely, I'd say kind of a rescue last minute. Can I ask Carolina to maybe lead the questions and then... And, and, yeah. And... Okay. Um... I guess uh, uh, Dr. Kim, you spoke a little bit about this, but one of the audience members, Dr. Piper asked, if you could uh, expand a little bit what you think the role of KI-67 and P53 should be with the departure from atypical meningioma. Yeah, it's a bit of, it's problematic, right? <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of data out there suggesting that uh, many atypicals just are not gonna behave badly. But the fact is that, you know, these numbers keep coming up. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm less convinced about the P53 data, quite frankly, because I think even among our eight carcinomas, two of them did not have any, uh, they were not atypical because they did not have P53 staining. So I think that's, and I think that's also been reported abundantly in the literature, frankly. So I think P53 is just less trustworthy, is would be my initial inclination. KI67, you know, uh, probably should be used in, in conjunction with mitoses. And also, I think also symptoms, because it's likely that people feel symptoms because something's growing quickly. If it's uh, slow, then, you know, they, be, they wouldn't be feeling it. So I think there is something to be said about the, the proliferation that is associated with aggressiveness. Um, I mean, me personally, I think it's probably a combination of brisk proliferation and something leading to subtotal resection is my feeling. Uh, I would say that's one class of aggressive. And I mean, there's certainly other subsets, like, you know, if you resist radiation or something like that, that's probably a different thing. It's just about general thoughts. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think my connection got lost, but um, thank you. Um, the, I guess the other question that I had for, for, for your uh, talk was, were the patients who didn't get uh, resection, like an in, in initial resection. I mean, the patients who did well, those are patients who they had, like, was there a reason there was residual left behind, like invasion of the cavern sinus or any reason why they would have need to be, um, you know, in the multiply resected group? Yeah, I think, I think that's you. So I think that's where invasiveness comes into play because it's perhaps in a place where, you know, where you can't get it as easily. And I think that's why, for instance, for Chuya, it turns out that the invasiveness of the cavernous sinus is a significant factor. I think it is related to that, uh, honestly. Yeah. I mean, not all of these were my patients specifically. Uh, we probably should go so, sort of look at the, um, the relative, you know, uh, inoperability or invasiveness of all of them. I think that's, we're looking at NASP first, but that's not the only thing that's, you know, hard to get to, obviously. But I, it, I think it generally is something like that. I do have to say, you know, it also depends on your level of uh, uh, expertise and experience, right? I mean, there's a learning curve for everyone, like uh, I think Dr. Evans was saying. Yeah, and I think that's the you know does does a high volume center or does a does a person's experience change whether something's really considered you know aggressive or more difficult to resect? Obviously, that's going to change, be surgery yeah. dependent or at least institution dependent. So I think that's um, a really good point. Dr. Periselda, I guess somebody was asking if the adenoma, the first adenoma that you showed, um, whether that was a non-secretor, um, and I, they were asking about whether or not, uh, why you went with surgery rather than treating medically. If I remember correctly, that was a pretty large tumor that had compression. Well, yeah, that's a, if they're referring to the giant one, it was not a prolactinoma. Okay. It was a non-secreting tumor with hydrocephalus and um, visual loss. The patient actually collapsed at work and was nearly blind. And he fortunately would put an EVD and then brought him uh, a day later to the operating room. Um, we had to do a septostomy with the EVD as well, because obviously it was not going through the third ventricle. Yeah. So, and then we brought him to surgery one or two days later, and he actually did very well. We could win the EVD and he was discharged. So, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the there we definitely, there's definitely plenty of literature to suggest that the prolactinomas, you know, even some of the, uh, the medically refractory ones really do become a surgical challenge. Um, and you sort of exhaust your, your medical options and then you have to revert to surgery at that point. Um, Dr. Kim, uh, have you extended your study? Uh, Dr. Muther is asking if you've extended your studies to somatostatin receptor expression. Um, they were wondering if this has any implications for uh, peptide radio receptor therapy. Um, no, no, we haven't. We haven't looked at that yet. Uh, I, mean, I mean, that's a that's a great question, but uh, no, we haven't looked at that. Yeah. And then Dr. Evans or, and Dr. Zimmer, both you guys uh, can answer to speak a little bit about this. But do we have statistics of the morbidity and mortality of the temporal parietal fascia um, flap to evaluate risks versus benefits in terms of when to choose to use them? We don't have uh, a statistical data on that. Um, certainly, as I alluded, there's some morbidity to it, but I'm not sure that I have enough volume to give good statistics on that. Um, we haven't gathered that data as yet. I don't know, Lee, do you have any, uh, no. any thoughts? I'm not sure I've even seen a paper on that. 
No, I, I, we've done very few in our practice and beyond what um, Jim already talked about with the frontal branch of the facial nerve, which is really the biggest issue for patients if you, if you get that. Uh, it's a very hardy graft, so we've never had an issue with failure uh, with a temporal parietal fascia graft. Uh, you know, it's it's really a workhorse for open endoscopic and um, using it for skin cancers and other things around the ear. Uh, we've had great success with it, but I don't I don't think any any of our institutions have the volume to really put together that type of answer. Well, it's, just, it is, I'm just going to reinforce the one thing with that graph, as I mentioned, just to bear in mind that it's, it's so versatile. As long as you don't pinch off its graft, um, <laughs> it's got to maintain blood supply at least for a decent period of time until it gets its own uh, supply from the donors, from, from the recipient site. But the important thing is, again, you can fold it and tuck it and get very creative with it. Unlike a nasal septal flap that's just got to lay down and, and you can't trap it anywhere, um, this you can tuck and get very creative and put it underneath other grafts and lay it underneath the nasal septal flap partially. And it's, it's very versatile. So just, just remember that if you ever need to use it. It's kind of, it's interesting, the, the different rates of uh, spinal fluid leak. Um, I guess Dr. Evans and Dr. Zim, do you guys, when would you use fat if ever? It seems like uh, you take a very minimalistic approach and it, it sort of just amazes me how different institutions have such different leak rates. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I wish there was just like a one answer fits all for this, but uh, it's very tricky. Well, I have to tell you, when we, if we don't have a nasal septal flap, we haven't forgotten fat. You know, fat's been used for years, decades uh, for repair. We recently had a gentleman who had a um, sublabial approach, and, and the bottom line is he just didn't have a viable nasal septal flap, and his adenoma was six centimeters. It was massive, and he's in his 70s, and, and we were actually able to get a tremendous resection on this very, very, very large uh, pituitary, recurrent pituitary adenoma that was operated on almost 25 years ago. And, and quite honestly, I just, we just decided to uh, use fat in this gentleman um, after we use, I'm trying to remember what we use, we might use a, a donor fascia lata, which we've had great success with actually. And he healed up wonderfully, you know, and we do use lumbar drains. I, we, you know, uh, I always said the biggest downside to a lumbar drain is the quality of your nursing staff. And um, he healed wonderfully. So we still use that instead of going ultra fancy with some of these Adam's nation and Adam and I are good friends, derived graphs that he lived his career on uh, from about 2008 to 2013, uh, just, just to preserve other structures and not to create more havoc when we need to. Um, not that there's, potential downsides to an abdominal fat graft, but uh, we still find it to work very well in the appropriate circumstances. So I really don't use fat much at all, as I mentioned, uh, any longer. I used to use it in every case. I, I trained with Ed Laws. Uh, I first started doing all my pituitary work as a resident, and uh, that's how we started the case, right? We took a fat graft and then went on. But any longer, as I mentioned, just in the dead space, if I need that often, I just go to gel foam now if there's dead space from the clival defect or from an odontoid or that sort of thing. Um, I don't think it's a dirty word. I just, I don't find it necessary, uh, uh, you know, all the time and, and, and very, very rarely use it. But like I said, Carolina, the important thing is just what you get used to. I mean, look at Roy Cassiano at your place. He yeah. could put up a graft and just tuck gel foam around the edges. And I would have a hundred percent leak rate if I did that, but somehow in his hands, it works. And I think that's part of this is kind of figure out what all the repertoire is. And then you kind of narrow down and hone in what works for you and just learn how to do it well. And I think that's probably the most critical thing as of, as we know right now. And, and I agree. I agree with that completely. I mean, the key to these closures is taking your time and doing it well. And, and in my mind, as much bone that you can get that reconstruction over the higher the chance that you're going to be successful on that repair. Uh, can, can I ask Maria a question? Uh, Maria, what's, uh, 
what uh, what is your neuroanatomical explanation why pituitary apoplexy is more likely much more likely to cause a third nerve palsy than a sixth nerve palsy do you have a sense of what what what's the explanation so i'm not completely sure about it but i think that uh, maybe it's because you know, the sixth nerve is kind of lateral to the carotid exactly. And the third nerve, there's a, a spot just up top of the posterior band of the carotid, what I think is more exposed. So that's the only thing I can think of, but that's something that has been very fast. You know, I've, I've always asked myself that question. Mm. You don't think it's because the third is much more tethered in the roof of in the oculomotor triangle and yeah, could I be. Guess, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, can I ask Albert a question? Albert, you haven't probably because of the length of time. What's your impression? Uh, because I, Bill Caldwell and myself share the same experience regarding the question mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you. Big, large, aggressive pituitary adenomas that you resect partially. Have you had bad experience with that? With partial resection? of giant pituitary adenomas? Well, I get, I mean, if you have no choice, I, I, I guess you, you always risk, risk the hemorrhage immediate post-op yeah. risk uh, is one thought. Um, I would say, if I think about them, they have recurred, but it hasn't been catastrophic. Uh, many of them, I've, for instance, we've, if we haven't gone back, we've radiated, but have they catastrophically been like sort of like the cases I described, like the carcinomas? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was particularly asking you about the hematoma rate and I'd, I'm going to use that. Maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that definitely immediately yeah. post-op. That's definitely something to worry about for sure. I could comment on that, Jacques. Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I was going to ask you, Jim, specifically, like, first of all, tell us your general approach to giant adenomas that you well, do you that you don't think you can get completely without mm. with one approach, or, or yeah. just tell, tell, give us? It, that's a great, uh, great problem that I think we all have. So the first issue is if you go into nasal, I think, or into Scott or any transnasal, whatever you'd like, and remove the the bottom part of a tumor where it disrupts venous outflow and that sort of thing, and you leave that piece that's up in the third or tucked back in the brain stem or whatever. Uh, that's the problem, right? That's what you're alluding to. That can infarct, that can hemorrhage, that can be a big problem, swell, and uh, you'll be rushing back in there to take it out. So you try to avoid that if possible. Uh, it depends upon whether this tumor crosses any critical neurovascular structures as well. So if you've got a large portion that's central and something that's out lateral or beyond the carotid or that sort of thing, then you're going to be kind of forced into not crossing critical neurovascular structures that work like cranial nerves. And uh, in that case, I would favor to take the, the superior part out first, do the transcranial part first, try to get good hemostasis and a direct visualization, and then come back for the endonasal part. I have staged a number of cases. We, we uh, put together a paper on that a while back and um, just staged endonasal by taking out the central portion of the tumor and then giving some time for the top to kind of come down. I got away with it in a number of cases, but as you get more experience and you see what happens uh, to your own cases and, and elsewhere, there is some risk to leaving that, that large uh, intracranial portion. So if I've got to go transcranial first, or I've got to go transcranial in, in endonasal, if that's what you're driving at, Jock, I would do the transcranial part first, get good hemostasis and a direct visualization, maybe not push my luck, and be ready to come back endonasal. The troubles you, you can run into there is this uh, simultaneous surgery, I think is not necessarily good, where you're doing endonasal and transcranial. We've, we've worked with that as well. And I think the risk of, of infection and and other problems is greater somehow and these are coupled together. So I'd rather separate the two somehow temporally and, and literally. Um, but I, I think that's sort of the general premise, uh, Jacques, that I would take. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you completely. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. No, I agree with that as well. I Sometimes you try to, to get everything from the midline to the end of nasal approach. You allow the top to come down. Um, yeah, the top is the issue. Yeah, that's true postoperatively. Or you do two different approaches, but never on the same day. I, I, I agree with that. And, and a little reminder that as we all got married to endonasal endoscopy, there is still a way to enter the cella from above. You know, it's no, no, seriously. I mean, if you're there and you think you can finish the job from above because you just do it, drill the clinoid and it's a trans, you know, the Dolling approach and this, the tumor has done the dissection. So that's 
got to be remembered as well. Uh, can I ask another question to the panels? Um, Craniopharyngioma recurrent that was previously done endonasally. Actually, the case that David was going to ask you, but for the sake of time, I, I'm just making it into question. Um, any hesitation in going back endonasally, or do you hesitate because you're expecting scarring to to arteries, to the chiasm? What are your general thoughts? Maybe I can start with you, Albert, and then maybe Maria, and then the rest. Was it gross total resection the first time? Gross total the resection the first time, it recurred, supracellar. Uh, Retrochiasmatic or? Uh, yes. David, do you want to just pop up the pictures if you have it there? I, uh, he has it and yeah, sure. Well, it'll work. Go ahead, sure, if you want. No, no, I mean, obviously, scarring is going to be a concern, but for retrochiasmatic, uh, I know nasal still is the best angle, and I would try to see if I could go that way again, quite honestly. I, I, that was what I would the try. The reason I could... say that is our good friend Fred Gentili, interestingly, mm. um, says he never does a craniopharyngioma redo endonasally because he hates the scar and he always goes transcranially. I see. So, Maria, what are your thoughts? So I think if he's retrochiasmatic, it's, um, it's, it's a very, it's a better angle, I think, endoscopically if he goes very high still. So I would look at the anatomy and, you know, mm -hmm. the vessels and figure it out, but um, yeah. Yeah, that I, I would consider a radio in the nasal. Jim, just and as a general question. Jacques, I, I've done this plenty of times on some of yeah. our early cases that recurred of our own, and, and, and certainly some that have been transferred into us. Uh, I've done it enough times. Uh, it can be tricky. I think it depends on the window you have. Certainly, the access to the region we're talking about is going to be better this way than, than most others. You know that. Um, the problem sometimes is mobilizing nasal septal flap. You know, can you adequately mobilize without damaging? Can you reutilize the flap? What other tissue do you have available? Is there a flap on the other side? A lot of the considerations, um, but we do it. We've learned to mobilize the flap very safely. The flap gets stiff. You can actually score the back of it with, with uh, sort of parallel cuts and get it to mobilize without destroying blood supply. And um, so we, we've got a way to do that and we've had to do it. In fact, I was in Korea one time at SNU and we were operating, um, Mark Rosen and I, and one of the cases they gave us was a redo, re redo, redo, radiated craniopharyngioma and the chairman's best friend's mother. Try that. <laughs> and we did that live. And uh, so we were looking at each other saying, oh my God, but it actually worked out fine. We were able to mobilize, methodically work our way through and get a good resection and, and a good repair. Um, so it's feasible to do. You've just got to, same like, like Leah's saying, you've got to still prepare your donor site and get your flaps back where they belong and be meticulous with opening and closure so you don't burn any bridges. Um, as far as the intradural part, they're all stuck. Take your time, be patient. You can usually work your way through. If you hit a wall, you may have to stop. Consider any other open approaches you can combine with naturally. Um, consider radiation if it hasn't been done. This particular patient you know, had been operated twice and radiated. So um, I think resection was the best bet, but we've, we've had to battle that. I just wouldn't totally turn the switch off as Fred might. There's our other approaches, you know, Fred loves translamina approach and we've got eyebrow and other things to utilize now. They're, they're very useful in our armamentarium, but I, I don't hesitate or I wouldn't have a lot of hesitation going back into natives. We've done it enough. Jacques, what did you end up doing? Just no, in the, in the case I showed you, I did it transcranial and, and took care of it, but I've certainly done redo... Jacques. Oh, I think he was just saying how we, he's definitely done the redo endoscopic and I think that's that's an option as well. Yes. Um, and I don't see any last minute questions. So um, if Dr. Marcos does not sign back on, just thank you everybody again, fantastic talks and always uh, learning so much from all the panelists and all the great questions from the audience. So thank you audience for, for tuning in and uh, tune in back again uh, in about a month. We'll have another session of these. Um, there he is. Fascinating, the Wi-Fi, how it dies suddenly, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, it's like that. No, I was going to say, is my attempt to save the pituitary stalk that clearly caused the recurrence. And that's another interesting topic. That's a whole other topic, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Carolina, are, are there any more questions that we haven't?
Dacum? No, no, I was just saying, I was just uh, thanking everybody for their participation and the audience for their questions and really fantastic talks as usual. Any, anybody, any panelist wants to ask any other questions to the other panelists or tell them that they're full of it or anything, please, this is the time to do it. <laughs> We're all good. I'm no, no, I was just chatting to, to Dr. Evans. I'm, I'm going to look at, uh, we, we tend to do nasal septal flap and a little dural inlay. I was going to look at perhaps some of the things he discussed today. Uh, sure. I think they're, they're great ideas, you know. The yep. bottom graph is just... Line, Albert. Yeah, that'd be great. And I want to give kudos to Maria. That was beautiful anatomical work. You know, I worked with Jeff Keller. You probably know Jeff's name from uh, mm -hmm. Mayfield Clinic University of Cincinnati and, and our work there. I mean... There's nothing short of, of great anatomical pres presentations. You know, and I try to add the physio physiological on top of that and having a PhD in neuroanatomy, I just really love seeing individuals, uh, both who I know from Pittsburgh and other places just providing just great anatomy. It's, it, it is the, the end all end all of what we do and for the training of our residents and fellows, it's, it's beautiful stuff and it's, highly unappreciated the hours we spend on cadavers to present that information thank you not not only presentation but it makes you such a better surgeon i mean to just i mean look at the trend people like maria like juan fernandez miranda like evandro de Oliveira. i mean that whole lineage of people who got to appreciate and respect the anatomy and then just to become such a subtle high quality surgeons again for the young people listening to us if you have an opportunity to go just go to a lab and and, and do what maria and, and and lee and others have done and spend the hours to understand the minutia it may look like it's futile thing to do when, while you're doing it but you can see what it leads to okay on this uh, very hopeful note i thank everybody for participating i thank the audience and see you all next month. Ladies and guys, see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank Good you. to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good night.